So till now we have seen question number one to five. Now let us check out the question number six. In the question number six, they are saying let n be an NFA with n states. Okay, we have an NFA with the total of n states. Let k be the number of states in a minimal DFA. So we have a DFA, and this DFA is having a total of k states, which is equivalent to n. So that means this NFA and this TFA both are equivalent. Now in NFA we can have more states as compared to DFA, but uh, for every NFA we can make an equivalent DFA. Now they are asking which of the following is necessarily true? Which of the following is true? Okay, they are giving us some options which are related to the states of these NFAs and these DFAs. Now first of all, you should know what is the definition of finite automata. So finite automata can be defined by four qu uh, uh, for quintuples, which is Q, summation. Q naught, delta, and f. We know all these values, where Q is denoting a set of states. Summation is denoting set of input alphabets. Q naught is denoting initial state, which is always single. Delta is denoting transition function. Transition function and f is denoting set of final states. Set of final states. Now, what is the difference between the definition of NFA and the definition of DFA? Because here the question is related to the definitions of NFAs and DFA. Now, in DFA, this, 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 and this. All these four things remain the same as well as in case of NFA as well as in case of DFA. The only thing that is the biggest that creates the biggest difference between NFA and DFA is the delta, which is a transition function. Now, when I say the transition function for DFA, it means when we have a Q that is a set of states, and to any state, if we get give some input alphabet, now it takes us to Q states. Okay, but in case of NFA, if we have a state Q. We give it to some, give it some input alphabet. Now it maps up, or you can say, it takes us to two raised to power q states. That means the number of states in which a state in NFA can go is two raised to power q, which is far greater than the number of states in DFA. You can denote it like this. If this is the q, now this will be two raised to power q, which is a power set of the states q. That means every uh, state can go to a power set here. Now. Because a state in NFA can lead us to lead us to many states, that is a lot more state as compared to DFA. Hence, there are more transitions can be there in NFA, and in some cases we can also have an epsilon transition in case of NFA. But in DFA we cannot have an epsilon transition. Now, for this particular case, which is saying which of the following is necessarily true, here if the number of states are small n. If the number of states are small n, now the transitions that we can have in uh, NFA, which can be two raised to power n, or any state can lead us to two raised to power n different states. Therefore, by this same definition, we, if we say that k be the number of states in a minimal DFA, remember they are asking about minimal DFA. If the word minimal is not there, then we can we could have a different solution. But here exactly they are saying we have a minimal DFA. Now. In case of minimal DFA, this k will always be less than two raised to power n, because in NFA we can have two raised to power n different states. Okay. Therefore, the solution to this problem is option number D, where we having k is less than or equal to two raised to power n. So this is the true answer. This is the correct answer for this question number six. Correct. Now the question number seven is again from theory of computation. It is saying set of all recursively enumerable languages is number one closed under complementation, number two closed under intersection, number three a subset of the set of all recursive languages, and number four is an uncountable set. See for this you should understand two things. One is what is the closure property? What is the set of uh, what are the families of languages? And then how these languages are closed under which of the following which operation? 
see if this is the set or I should design it right like this that will be better if this is the set of regular languages then this is the set of all context free language that every regular language is context free then this is the set of context sensitive language then this is the set of recursive languages then this is the set of recursively enumerable languages this is the biggest set okay now when i'm saying closed property that means if let us say we have a regular language we perform some operation on this regular language then the after performing this operation the outcome is also a regular language then we can say this regular language is closed under that particular operation the same thing is valid for every other language now we have this table that you should remember actually it's not important to remember you should understand all these things thoroughly then you will be able to derive most of things in the examination hall now we have different operations here like union intersection complementation concatenation clan closure homomorphism epsilon free homomorphism substitution inverse homomorphism reverse and interaction intersection with a regular language a regular language is closed under all these operations and in this question if you see here they are asking about the recursively enumerable languages now this is the set of recursively enumerable languages and recursively enumerable language is also closed under all the operations except the operation which is complementation that means if we take a recursively enumerable language and if we do a complement of that recursively enumerable language then we might get a language which is not recursively enumerable we might get a language which is recursive rather than recursively enumerable so the first option is saying the recursively enumerable languages are closed under complementation the first option here that they have given it is actually wrong the first option is wrong because the recursively enumerable language are not closed under complementation second is closed under intersection recursively enumerable languages are closed under intersection res as you can see here in the table when we show intersection here at this place we have written yes the recursively enumerable languages are closed under intersections intersection that is correct third it is a subset of set of all recursive languages but at as you can see this recursive language itself is a subset of recursively enumerable language this recursively enumerable language is superset a superset of recursive languages of recursive languages and the fourth one is an uncountable set option number d is saying as uncountable set it is also false why because these recursively enumerable sets are denoting the set of turing machine that means for every turing machine every turing machine is representing a recursively enumerable language okay so set of all recursively enumerable languages are infinite set of all recursively en enumerable languages are infinite but they are countable that is why they are called as countable infinite countable infinite so this option number d is also wrong so only correct option here is option number b okay now the next question here that is also from theory of computation but uh, this theory of computation question is actually uh, uh, apart from compiler design because compiler design and theory of computation both are interrelated with each other so they are saying which of the following statement is false the first statement the context free grammar can be used to specify both lexical and syntactical rules now these lexical rules are actually nothing but regular expressions okay and we can use context free grammars to represent such rules okay and therefore and these regular expressions are actually uh, you can say these regular expressions are represented by the regular language and every regular language is a subset of context free language and this for these context free languages we have context free grammars we have context free grammars okay so these lexical rules are nothing but regular expressions only hence they can be represented by context free grammar fine and 
Secondly, the syntactical rules can also be represented by context-free grammars. So this option number A is true, it is not false. Option number B is saying type checking is done before parsing. Type checking is done before parsing. Now for this particular case you understand that this type checking is always be done after parse tree generation. This can all only be done only be done after parse tree generation. After parse tree generation. After parse tree generation. Okay. So this, uh, if I give you more detail about this, I can say that this uh, type checking is done during. This is done during semantic analysis. Is done during semantic analysis phase. Analysis phase, and this semantic analysis phase is uh, done after parsing. Is done after parsing. So option number B is false because type checking is not done before parsing, it is done after parsing, it is not before, it is after. Option number C is saying high level language program can be translated to different intermediate representations. That is also correct. Why? Because we have different intermediate rep representations like we have three address code, we have uh, syntax tree representation, we have post fix notation, we have so many different notations here. So option number C here is also true because this high level language uh, programs can be translated to uh, mostly it is translated to three address code which is the most popular code here. And the option number D is saying the arguments to a function can be passed during program stack. And that is also true. Why? Because this program stack, when we discuss about this program stack, this program stack holds the following information. Number one. It holds the information related to the activation record. Activation record. I hope that you have studied my lectures for compiler design because there I've completely specified this. It is done using active. It is storing activation record of a function, which stores the function parameters. It stores the function parameters. Function parameters. It also stores the return value it also stores the return address all these information etc etc okay so this argument to a function can be passed during the program stack that is also correct and this option is true so the only wrong option here is option number b which is false that is type checking is done after parsing it is not done before parsing okay let us check out the next question Guys, it's a very interesting question. This is a part that you should not miss while watching this video. Take a notebook and a pen and try to see how I solve this question. Uh, actually, this is a theoretical question, but uh, it is related to, you know, interrupt processing. It's a very interesting thing, okay? Because some, in some of the books, this is not given. So, you should have, uh, you should study the other books also. I mean, you have to refer other material to solve this book, this question. He's saying the following are some events that occur after a device controller issues an interrupt while lang process while process L is under execution. Number one, the process pushes the process status of L onto the control stack. Number two, the processor finishes the execution of the current instructions. Number three, the processor executes the interrupt service routine. Number four, the processor pops the process state of L from the control stack. And number five, the processor loads the new program counter value based on the interrupt. Now, which of the following is the correct order in which the events are occurring? This is a very straightforward question. So you should know what is it, you know, what is the sequence of these operators. It's a very straightforward question. If you know the entire sequence, then you can solve it within seconds. But if you don't know, then you'll be facing issues in solving this question. So generally when an interrupt occur, so this, all these things happens, okay. So some of things are related to the hardware side and some of these things are occurring on the software side. So on the hardware side, when the device controller or the system hardware issues an interrupt or system hardware issues and interrupt now this is first given to uh, you know 
what happens after this a processor finishes execution of the current instruction the processor finishes execution of current instruction which is it is currently executing current instruction and then the processor signals acknowledgement of interrupt the, the, the processor gets that we have uh, an interrupt so processor signals acknowledgement of interrupt it says that yes i acknowledge that there is an interrupt then the processor pushes the processor pushes the program status word and program counter onto the control stack onto the control stack okay and then the processor loads new instruction the processor loads new program counter value based on interrupt then whatever kind of interrupt it is we can have different interrupt it can be rst 4.7.5 rst 6.5 rst 5.5 it can be a software interrupt or a hardware interrupt then this happens now these steps all these steps are actually hardware based steps after this the next steps are software based after this step is done then we save the remainder of process state process state information then this process is interrupted after this we restore the process state information we restore process state information and the last step is restore old process state word and program counter value okay now these steps are actually software based steps correct now unless you know that this particular order of execution happens you will not be able to solve this problem easily but still you can you know uh, perform uh, analysis on these statements if you don't know this one because you should know how uh, instruction what happens when you get an interrupt now here the correct answer here is that firstly we do the processor the processor finishes the execution of the current instruction that we have seen the second step is the processor pushes the process status of l onto the stack l is the instruction the third one is uh, the processor loads the new program counter value based on the interrupt the fourth one is the processor executes the interrupt service routine and the fifth one is processor pops the process state of l from the control stack and then if you write it down then it is q p t r and s which is matching the option number a so for this current answer of a question a question the answer is option number a which is q p t r s i hope that you understood this thoroughly if you face any difficulty just let me know in the comment section and if you like the video just also let me know then because that helps us to boost and it helps us motiv to motivate and create more videos like this now let us look at the next question which is the question number 10 it says consider process executing on a operating system that uses demand paging the average time for memory access in the system is m so average memory access time is m that is given and d units if the memory access causes a page fault now memory access time in case of page fault in case of page fault page fault given is d it has been experimentally measured that the average time taken for a memory access in the process is x units 
average time taken for a memory accessor process is x units that is average time taken that is average they are giving average memory access time is x units this is important which is the following is the correct expression for the page fault experienced by the processes so for page fault they are actually asking the values for this okay now first of all you should understand the formula for this generally when we calculate the average memory access time or is all sometimes it's also called called as effective memory access time so e mat and a mat so average memory access time or effective memory access time both are same which is calculated as page uh, 1 minus page fault rate multiplied by the memory access time when no page fault when no page fault plus page fault rate multiplied by memory access time with page fault okay it is also this page fault rate is also given in terms of probabilities is also in, given in terms of ratios now here assuming that the page fault rate is p and we know this value because this value is given as x and uh, this is they have given because this value they have given as m and this value they have given as d and this is what we are assuming as p therefore this entire formula can also be transformed this way that is x is equal to 1 minus p multiplied by m plus p into d now because they are asking for the page fault rate because they are giving all the other values so we just have to find the values of p so this can also be written something like this x is equal to m minus pm plus pd now take p as common between these two so we can have x is equal to p common then we'll be having d minus m plus m take this m this side so it is x minus m upon d minus m is equal to p so the value of p can be x minus m upon d minus m which is matching uh, the option number here b so b is the correct answer to this given question okay so i hope you understood the solution properly now let us look at the question number 11 to question number 15 okay 